Uh, so on the screen here, we have some folks from, from the internet. Uh, they stream themselves playing games for people to watch on a service called Twitch TV. Does anyone here watch Twitch? If so, can you pop your hand? Cool, we've got a, a couple of people. So uh, also, for the people who watch Twitch and also watch our video online, who gets really, really excited whenever you go to watch some content and you get an ad for a car popping up? Nobody? All right. <laughs> There's some Spalex people here who want to put their hand up, but fair enough. So yeah, um, we work with Twitch to help them make money from their content by putting video ads up, just like this. Uh, this is about me, I work for Spodex. I told you what we do, I'm on Twitter. Most of the slides here is because I'm really happy. Uh, the Irish domain registry people changed their rules recently. And I got the domain name, wyl.ie, my surname is Wally, so I'm super excited that's the only reason that's here. <laughs> uh, Spodex uses use lots of open source software. Here are some examples. Just from a quick glance, is there any any software here that anyone in the room has like actively contributed to or made any pull request towards? Cool. Okay, so it's his fault. He he puts ads on the internet. He works on the software that we use. The put ads, blame him, not me. <laughs> so just a quick agenda for today. We're going to talk about the ad tech industry, a bit of its history, how it came to be, where it is now, and we're going to talk about Druid, which is the main topic. It's a uh, an aggregate store that allows us to ask questions of literally terabytes and terabytes up to petabytes of data and get answers in really quick, really, really quickly. We'll talk about how it stores data. We'll talk about how queries work, what actually happens whenever you uh, send it a question to answer. We'll talk about approximate algorithms. So this is some uh, different solutions Druid offers to ask questions that are usually really difficult and really expensive to, uh, to compute, but there's some tricks it uses to answer those really quickly and not use very much, uh, very many resources, how it scales, and we'll chuck in a demo if we have time. That's Drew's logo. Yes, so in 1991, there was this guy, Tim Berners-Lee. He was working at CERN and released the, uh, the World Wide Web for everyone to use, and he did it for free, and it was good. A few years later, a guy, uh, Mark Anderson, released uh, Mosaic. It was uh, for Windows, Mac, and Unix. It was one of the first real popular browsers, and it supported graphics. So it was popular, and it supported graphics. So 10 seconds later, we got ads. <laughs> Here's the uh, actual very first ad. So not only did we get ads, but we also got clickbait at the very same time. <laughs> Wired had put up uh, a website called Hot Wired, Wired Magazine. Uh, AT&T paid them a bunch of money to put this ad. And uh, yeah, you can see <laughs> it's just total clickbait. So that's kind of what the industry looked like back then. People were putting up sites about like uh, owning dogs and all sorts of random stuff. And maybe like businesses maybe who sell dog treats would ring these guys up and be like, hey, I'll give you some money. Do you want to put an ad on the site? And everyone would be happy. The user wouldn't be too fussed. There'd be a wee graphic talking about the local dog treat store. They don't mind. The website owner is just, you know, he's doing this as a hobby. He's getting some money and your, your shops are getting more customers. It's all fine. So through the nineties, the web's starting to get a lot bigger. You have companies like Yahoo getting really massive and Google's coming out. AOL's getting pretty big too. So you get Lots of people making websites. I know really there's a lot of websites getting created. How are, how are these dog treat shop owners supposed to keep track of all these websites and build relationships and make sure that uh, like these websites are pitting the banners they want on and all that stuff? Uh, so that means you get this new company coming into the industry called Ad Networks. So what these guys would do would be is uh, they would hire uh, a big sales team. 50% of those sales teams, all of that sales team would ring around all the advertisers and be like, hey, got some great websites about dogs, you want to put your advertisements on it? And the other half would ring all the websites and gather up a portfolio of different websites in which they can show their ad. Uh, so this, basically the website owner would get like a little tag and whenever the user would visit the, the web page, it would call back to the ad network and load any ad that's available. But there's a problem. Uh, making an ad network really cheap, you just need to hire somebody who knows Linux and a big sales team. So lots of them start popping up. And publishers are kind of smart. They realize, hey, if I partner with one ad network, I get ads some of the time. But if I go partner with 10 different ad networks, I'll make more money and get lots of ads. So what they do is they include the tags from each of those ad networks into their page. So that means when a user visits the page, it calls the first ad network, waits to see if they have an ad. If they don't, it goes to the second ad network, waits to see if they have an ad, goes to the third and fourth. So that means the user is sitting waiting for ages to get their, pay get their page or an ad because of the way they've done this. So as a result, we get these guys called ad exchanges. 
So I know we're a new type of company in the industry. Instead of including the ad networks tag on their website, they would include the ad exchanges tag. And when the ad exchange gets called, uh, they basically call all these different ad networks in parallel and return whichever ad's paying the most money. Which means the user doesn't get as annoyed because it only takes maybe a second, you're not taking as much of the user's time. But we haven't learned, it's really easy to set up an ad exchange. So lots of them appear and publishers do the same thing again where they chain up different calls to ad exchanges and user experience now sucks. So this pattern repeats itself a few times through the past 20 years. Eventually we split the sort of industry in two. We've got these things called DSPs which sort of provide very advertiser focused tools and SSPs to provide very website owner publisher focused tools trying to maximise revenue or uh, eyes in the case of ads for both sides of the industry. Uh, so SpotX is an SSP we try and provide uh, for publishers, website owners, and try and make them as much money as we can. So yeah, uh, so in the case of Twitch TV, we partner with them. Whenever you go to watch some content on Twitch, as soon as you click on your favourite streamer, a request will come to Spot Exchange or SpotX. That request will be populated with different types of data, including maybe the player size, where you live, whatever they really think is interesting or might be of interest to advertisers. We'll then take that request and go talk to all our advertisers. So we have a real mixture of different ones. We have the classic ad networks, the same way the exchange used to work. We also partner with DSPs. Each of those DSPs will have their own ad networks. And we also do uh, some more fancy stuff, third party campaigns where you have like private marketplaces. So the, I'm sure you all know the ad tech industry has had problems with fraud and all sorts of stuff. So a bunch of premium publishers and premium advertisers have got together and made their own little walled gardens where they can bid on each other's inventory and not worry about Russian bots and stuff like that. So cool. When we, uh, when we call those advertisers, they can come back with different responses. They could say, nah, not interested. I don't want to display an ad to this person. They could say, uh, they could take too long to come back, in which case there's an error. They could come back with a bid. They could be like, yep, I want to show him an ad. I'm going to pay $15. Or they could be like, yeah, maybe I might pay $20, but I want to know more information first. So we take all that. We aggregate all that up and we take the, uh, the top bids. So maybe the four or five highest bids we'll send back to the browser. In the browser, we're running some extra code. That code will take all those advertisers that, that didn't commit, that weren't totally sure, and send them a request. So that means earlier on in the day, if you were talking to, uh, if you were looking on Amazon, and if you were looking at maybe a George Foreman grill, they might have set a cookie in your browser at that point. So when we make this follow-up request, if it's to the same domain name, it's going to include any information they have about you. So at that point, the advertiser might think, oh, okay, well, that's the guy who was looking at George Foreman Grill. I'm going to definitely pay that $20 to show him an ad now that they've got that extra information. So at that point, we've got all the responses. We'll take whoever's paying the most money and show you an ad. And you'll be happy because it's awesome. <laughs> While the ad's playing, uh, there'll be different beacons sent back to Spodex, so we have to track all these beacons, join them all together in order to provide reporting to let people know like how many people skipped an ad, how many people clicked on an ad, how many people quit halfway through, all these different metrics. And we do this at a big scale. We handle around 13 billion different ad requests every day. And there's some information there just about how we manage to do that. So yeah, uh, Spotlight grew really fast. It achieved this scale with not very many developers, with many, many, maybe about 10 guys in the office trying to put this together. And each of these ad requests need to be responded to in about half a second, otherwise the user might leave, so the website just cancels. Um, and we did all this in PHP. So basically our sort of approach for the first while was, is described by this cartoon. We've bought a whole bunch of metal, used cash efficiently, <laughs> and didn't necessarily worry about how we optimize our code. Uh, but that's changed. We're now a bigger company. We, can, we have more resources and we've taken all of that like a CPHP away and we've uh, re-implemented it in more efficient languages like C++. Hopefully the polar bears are a little bit happier. Fingers crossed anyway. But we do have this problem. We've got this ho big hose pipe of data coming in and our users want to ask questions of it. So uh, what sort of bucket do we use to collect this data and allow our users to be able to get the business value out of it that they want? So the first solution is MySQL. Basically, all the auction servers used to write files to uh, write all the information about the markets to files, and there'd be a process to collect all those files up and then perform aggregations to produce 
like very narrow tables in MySQL. So there'll be tables with like a bunch of different aggregations and metrics and a few dimensions. So that's good. Our users can ask really simple questions like how many times did uh, you know, I get a, an ad request uh, for this channel? How many times did this advertiser not bid on my inventory? All that kind of stuff. But when you ask more complicated, when you ask more complicated questions, it starts to fall apart. So yeah, if you want to ask stuff like how many people have visited my site from Limavady in the past five days between the ages of 25 and 35 who like sport and watch TV, then MySQL is just going to go on fire. At least at the scale we operate. That meant we looked at new technologies like uh, Hadoop and eventually Spark. So Hadoop is a, a distributed computation engine that means that we can take all these files that the auction servers are writing, put them in, the, in HDFS, which is a distributed file system, run like map produce jobs to produce those same narrow queries. But at the same time, our employees can build up queries which get turned into map produce jobs to ask questions. Uh, that, you know, those previous questions that MySQL can't answer. As well as that, we can also build up like little applications and utilities that uh, run on the schedule. So if a publisher wants to know, uh, wants to know some information, we can be like, yep, we can't tell you that right now, but we can add a wee report in so that you'll get an email every week with that information inside it. So where that kind of falls apart is if you come up, if you see some trend or anomaly in your data and you want to analyze it, you write a MapReduce or a Hive query. You have to wait like five, 10 minutes before you get an answer. So users lose their, their train of thought or fall asleep by the time they get a, get a result. And this is where Drew comes into play. So it is a, uh, an open source columnar aggregate store. And it takes some inspiration from the search engine world in order to answer questions really fast. Works really well when you've got streaming data and you want to give your customers like real time, uh, real, you want your customers to be able to ask questions of it in real time. It uh, indexes all its data into like a custom columnar format that's optimized for <coughs> aggregations and fiddlers. It's highly available. It supports lots of concurrent reads. So, as I say, it's extremely fast. So this kind of meme describes the evolution of our data stack over the past four or five years. Nowadays, we use a combination of the Spark and Druid uh, for, for everything data related. So a bit of background. <laughs> Druid was uh, built by a company called Metamarkets. They provide analytics services to the uh, the industry as a whole, the ad industry. Uh, their chief engineers and a bunch of their tech guys persuaded MetaMarkets to open source trade under the Apache license. And as soon as that happened, they all left and <laughs> formed their own company, providing uh, Druid as like a supported service, and that's called Imply. Uh, Druid's always been under the Apache license, or it's always been open source, uh, but Snapchat recently bought MetaMarket, so Druid itself, including like the trademarks and everything else, is being donated to Apache, the Apache Foundation, so it'll be owned and maintained by them uh, going forward. Lots of companies use Druid, not just for ad stuff. Uh, Netflix uses it for operations to m monitor the state of how things are uh, performing in various servers and such. Uh, there's also some use cases around IoT uh, because you've got lots of, Druid's really good at repetitive data. You've got lots of repetitive data from IoT devices, so it rolls up really nicely. Uh, so just a quick demo. Uh, this is actually real SpotX, real SpotX data to sort of show you the scale which we operate. But before my boss is sitting there, sort of rubby tackles me and tells me not to, it's actually heavy, heavily sampled and I've sort of fudged the numbers so you can't derive any actual business information from it, so ignore that. But it, the, data source is, uh, the data source is like raw, about 100 terabytes in Druid when it rolls up and does some sort of compression and summarization, it ends up being about 10 terabytes. And just because I was kind of I was kind of scared about like maybe leaking some business information, I've recorded this and cheated. it. So this is a tool called Superset. It's a uh, a graphical tool on top of Druid that the guys at Airbnb built. This is a dashboard with a bunch of widgets. Each of those widgets will execute a query on Druid whenever I change stuff, which you can see now. So as I kind of click about, I want to maybe dig into a certain country. In this case, I'm going to have a look at. Uh, how the UK is doing. So you can see all the queries get executed and returned super quick. I can have a flick through maybe the top regions here. I'm going to look for Belfast. I can click here and again get a result practically instantly. So this is overall a week and it's using like Arte Granularity. So I can change the Granularity to daily. 
and then I can look over uh, a longer period of time. So I'm going to pull that back to four months. So I'm querying four months of data, as I say, it's about 10, maybe 10 terabytes. And you get answers pretty much straight away. So yeah, here's an example of the type of data we might send to Druid. So this might be like ad events. So maybe we would store like the time in which an advertisement was played, the host in which the advert was uh, was shown, the country in which the end user and which the end user lives, and whether or not the user clicked on the ad. So Druid kind of performs this summarization process when it gets data. The original data, as you can see, has uh, the time stamp to the millisecond, but for most questions we want to answer, that's not important. So we can, we can grip it by the nearest R or whatever granularity we want. We can do maybe like 15 minutely data or daily data and uh, roll all that up. So when you give Drew some data to ingest, you need to tell it which of the fields are dimensions. So dimensions are things you might want to filter on or grip by. So I want to be able to ask questions and filter on host name and grip on country or grip on host name and filter on country, those kind of things. And I, uh, the second thing to tell it is which columns are metrics, i.e. which ones it should aggregate. So I want to tell Druid, hey, aggregate me uh, this click column because I want to know the total number of clicks for different types of, uh, different types of questions I'm going to ask. So that, like in, in the real world, uh, we've seen this summarization process where this, the, the footprint of data significantly anywhere from between 10 to 100 times. As I was talking about, like the, the data source that we were querying is maybe 100 terabytes in, in the dip or more. But in Druid, it's down to around 10. So that means queries happen much faster because there's less rows to scan. Cool. So we can talk a bit about the uh, underlying storage format that Druid uses. As I was saying, it's columnar. So that means we store in, in the sort of segment of data we have and the segments are partitioned by time, we can uh, store it in by column. So in this case, for example, the hostname column, there's two values. It will map those each unique value in a column to an ID. So we can take my dog.co.uk, map it to an ID of zero, yourcat.com, map it to an ID of one. And then when we store that, because uh, my dog.co.uk is in the first column, and that's zero, so our host name looks like zero, and then one for your cat, your, and one for your cat, because they're in the second two rows. The same for the other dimensions. And then <coughs> clicks is different, because it's an aggregate, we actually store the aggregate value in those segments. That's good, because it means you can have lots and lots of columns, and when you're only asking questions of two or three of those columns, it doesn't have any impact on the query. So the, uh, the second thing is whenever we ingest this data for dimensions which are strings, we can build a, an inverted index. So this is where we get kind of inspiration from search engines and like Lucene indexes in Elasticsearch. So we'll take each value that's present inside the column and we'll build this kind of index out of it. Out of it. So my dog.co.uk is only present in the first row. So that mean, means we have three rows, so our index is one, zero, zero. And then for your cat.com, it's only present in the second and third row. So our index is zero, one, and one. That means we can filter things really fast. So when I ask Druid, hey, give me the total number of clicks where my host name is mydog.co.uk or yourcat.com, it's just a matter of doing like a bitwise and on those two indexes. And then we get this result of one, one, one. So Druid, need, Druid only needs to aggregate the columns, sorry, the, the rows that get by to by the filter. So we can do those kind of things super quick. Okay. So as I talked earlier, we've got this big flow of data coming in. Uh, Druid can adjust this stuff in real time. It basically uh, takes all these events and stores them inside a, a concurrent hash map. It'll keep that concurrent hash map in memory until it gets to a certain size, and then it'll perform that indexing process we just talked about and put those into a segment. While that hash map is getting built, or maybe even indexed, it can answer queries of it, so it means you can get results of your data practically in real time, as soon as the data has been ingested, it's available for querying. So Drew can also take data from a dip. You can a dip in HDFS, so you submit like a, a request to Drew and it'll go to HDFS and fetch maybe JSON files, CSV files, Avro, whatever you want, run like a MapReduce job to do that index and we talked about. 
and then bring those segments back into RAID. So when it comes to querying, there's a few different nodes that are important. The first of those is the, the real-time peons. This is the node that's responsible for consuming data in real time and answering queries of any data that's currently being ingested. The second one is the historical. So the historical does two things. It takes all those segments and maps them into memory and then can answer queries on it. So it'll store like uh, specific segments for specific times. Beyond that, you have the broker. The broker is like the front end to the, uh, the query engine. So it understands where all the data segments are. It knows which historicals have which data. And whenever you ask it a question, it knows where to go. So in this case, like we could ask uh, a broker, execute this query on the past week. So it knows for today's data, I need to build up a query and send that to the real time node. For yesterday's data, I need to go to the historical one. For the day before's data, I need to go to the historical two. It'll build up that query plan and then send out all the queries to all the different nodes. It'll wait for the results and they'll be brought back in in a streaming fashion. They'll be merged up and then they'll go back to the user. So why this kind of breaks down is when you have uh, values like user ID. So Spotlight's maybe uh, over the past year I've seen 300 million different users. So if you want to maybe know like how many unique users have visited my web page, it'd be really difficult to answer that because you would need to store every single user ID that we've come across and then like match and compare against that, which can be very expensive and doesn't really work well. It's okay. There's uh, this algorithm called hyperloglog. So that's Fang Jin Yang, who's <coughs> one of the uh, founders and engineers of Dread, talks about it's basically a way of commuting the cardinality of some uh, multi set of data in a really sort of memory efficient way. You don't have to keep all those unique values in, uh, in disk or memory. You can just use this to build up like a, an approximate answer to it. So um, it does this by taking advantage of probability. So just a little run through. Uh, if I roll a, a fair six sided dice, chances of me getting a one are about one in six. Chances of me rolling two dice and getting two ones is about one in 36. And similarly, if I roll uh, three dice, the chances of me getting three ones is around one in 216. So that means if I tell you I rolled a single dice n times, and at some point during these rolls, I got <coughs> three ones in a row, can anyone tell me roughly how many times I might have rolled the dice? Well, 200, sweet, yeah. So the probability of me getting three ones is about one in 216. So it means if, I've, if I tell you I at some point got three ones, I probably rolled the dice about 200 times because there's nothing better to do than roll the dice all day. <laughs> so hyperloglog log uses this sort of idea through hash functions. So it, it will it'll stream through a data set, take all of them, hash it. And the, the results that hash have two really useful properties. Number one is when you put the same string in, so if you put the same user ID in, you'll always get the same result in hash. Number two is the output of a hash will look fairly random. So if you take a, a binary, binary representation of a hash, so zeros or ones, and look at each individual value, there's usually a 50% chance of it being a zero and a 50% chance of it being a one. So you can say that hash the string is kind of like flipping a, a coin over and over again. And that means you can kind of build up this little probability map. So I know if I hash a bunch of, a bunch of strings, every time I do it, there's a 50% chance of it starting with a one, because it'll rise, it will start with a zero. There's a 25% chance of it starting with zero one, because it could be, you know, zero, zero, one, zero, and one, one, and so on. So that means if you like have some data coming in the streaming, you just hash every value and keep track of the, uh, maximum number of leading zeros. And then you can work backwards from that to be able to make a guess at how, how many unique values were in that set. Um, it's a little bit more complicated, more at a time. Hyperloglog log also uh, sort of does this in various buckets because you might be unlucky, you could have a guy called Bob and maybe Bob hashes into like uh, some hash with a million lead or like 10 leading zeros. So that totally screws up your cardinality estimate. So Hyperloglog log does some tricks using this, these kind of registers as, as I've shown up here. And uh, basically whenever you ask for the cardinality, it'll take an average of all those values, rather than that, which prevents that kind of variance that you get. There's a little demo there that I'll share on Twitter 
and it basically shows how uh, hyperlog log works. The sort of step I, I missed out. So that means uh, we can go back to our question of how we actually store up the status. So rather than treating a user as a dimension and asking how many unique values are there at query time, we can aggregate the user ID as a metric. We can aggregate it into this hyperlog log structure so we can merge these rows really easily if we need to to get the total cardinality of different data sets or even this will represent the cardinality of these individual rows. So yeah, that's hyperlog log. Uh, one thing about Dreadly is it maps these segments into memory, so that can be expensive if you have lots of data and uh, you want to be able to query on it fast. It's a good idea to have uh, machines with lots of RAM. What it does is it like memory maps it, so it'll page in and out of memory from disk. So if you have SSDs, it can still be quite fast, but if you want the super performant cluster, you need to invest in RAM. Excuse me. So um, <laughs> one, of the, uh, one of the advantages we have is most of our queries are for recent data. It's very rare that we'll have one of our customers asking for data more than a year old. So that means we can kind of tear, tear everything. We can tell Druid, hey, whenever you get recent data, put it on these really beefy machines with crap tons of RAM, and whenever someone queries it, go to them. And then we can say for older data, maybe over a year, uh, put those in these old rusty machines with lots of disk that can answer the questions, but just take a bit longer. So that's one way we've sort of tried to save on cost or we're looking in terms of saving cost. A couple of other issues that have come up that um, the community is kind of actively talking about and thinking of ways to solve is that because the broker needs to wait for every historical node to reply to a query, it means that your query is only ever as fast as your slowest historical. So that means you need to have like a real good operational posture. You need to like be able to monitor these nodes and watch out for slow ones. To a certain extent, Nigeria does do some sort of self-management where it will realize, hey, historical C it's performing really crap, take some data away from it, maybe it's a different one, but it's still a problem that we can run into from time to time. A second sort of topic of discussion in the open source community at the moment is, uh, Druid was built following the kind of map or disk paradigm of we should query data where it sits. So that means these historical nodes have lots of data inside them and they're also the thing which perform the queries. So uh, one thing they're talking about is leveraging these new cloud uh, data sources like S3, which can stream data in a massively parallel way and seeing if we can make the historical nodes just be purely compute nodes. That means whenever a query is asked, we will stream data from S3 and process it as it comes in. Uh, and that means you can scale this up and down way, way faster. If you've got a big query load coming in, no worries, just pay our AWS for a bunch more compute nodes and they'll spin up. Whereas at the moment when they spin up, they have to load a pile of data into memory and that takes a long time. Uh, but yeah, so hopefully today you've learned a little bit about the history of ad tech, you've learned a little bit about SpotX and also about Druid and how class it is. Uh, quick, <laughs> quick note about SpotX, uh, we're hiring, we've got, uh, if you want to work in this stuff, come talk to us. We've got an open night uh, coming up in a few weeks' time. It's a really fun company to work for, a really good atmosphere, and we're working on a bunch of cool stuff. Any questions? Not from this side of the room. <laughs> Go for it. Um, what's the impact on the historical data? Should you change the schema? Like, do you need to manipulate that, or can it still bridge two schemas? Yes, yeah, good question. So uh, we're asking if uh, changes to schema affect things too much. So Druid uh, has inbuilt support for schema evolution. So uh, it means if you have like a stream of data and you add new columns to it, uh, it'll handle that fine. It'll just realize there's new data there and index it in by default as a dimension. If like uh, your scheme has changed and uh, you ask a question of maybe a year ago where that column didn't exist, Dread will just assume it's nil, it'll treat it as if there, the column does exist but it's nil, so it's kind of like weakly typed almost. If the column's not there, it'll still answer the question as if the column's there but it just doesn't have any values. So you don't get any errors in like that. Good. Uh, you, so you can, up, you can update data, you can re-index re older data and uh, push those segments out. So that's the process we do. We like, try our best to, re to ingest data in real time, but obviously there's problems sometimes. So we'll have a process that runs later that re ingests data. And that's also really useful because it means that you can, like if you've got a big wide data set with a whole crap ton of dimensions, and that doesn't roll up very well because of all those high cardinality dimensions, you can say, okay, sorry customers, but you can't ask questions of, 
uh, A, B, and C columns over a year old. So you can re-index that data and have less dimensions, which means that it rolls up nicer and is much more efficient and cheap to, to query on. Are we keen to go to the pub or are there any more questions? <laughs> Yeah, so it'll filter out like the columns it cares about and it'll sort of you lose some information. You don't get the same sort of granularity that you would do if you're just storing raw logs. I mean, raw logs will have like millisecond level uh, timestamps, whereas we're grouping everything by whatever time we've configured. So, uh, like a time series? Yes, time series. It, it, all the data is stored in a time series fashion, yeah. 